field with a specialized method of what is, of, of what is called research. Of course, there is no field of science, math, or research that actually is qualified to make such a judgment. But it is a determination held with aggressive certainty in the absence of a logical justification. Why does it make all this matter? You're asking, I'm sure. <laughs> well, if our four questions of moral understanding are not fields of knowledge, then one can't seek or assert authoritative answers as being in accord with reality. One can't teach answers that are true. One can't direct action in accordance with those answers. And one can't suggest policies flowing from those answers. If, for example, in the situation of a man heading toward the closed glass door, we, if we are told that there really is no way to know whether or not the glass door is open or not, we would not have the confident basis for intervening and warning him. Warning him, intervening with him with authority and certainty that he's going to get smacked. We would be allowed to sit back and believe that for ourselves, the door is closed, and so we won't be running into it. <laughs> and we might be allowed to quietly, lamely suggest that maybe it might be possibly better for someone to consider that the door might be closed. <laughs> <laughs> but all this would be too weak to actually help the man vigorously and confidently enough to save him from his now broken nose. Because it's a matter of some urgency. Again, why do we do this now? Well, it turned out to be true that there really is something called moral knowledge, let's say, that has to be true. I.e., there is an accurate understanding of reality. Now, what is real? What is the good life? Who is a good person? And how one becomes a good person? Then answers that accord more with reality than answers that are illusions and mistakes about reality. Then, sooner or later, reality is going to win and students and citizens will have received no help from a contemporary university being taught and being taught this knowledge or in directing action or no help in developing policy in accordance with those answers. Needless to say, any such answers will have the authority and confidence of knowledge, that is, any answers coming from moral knowledge, what we're calling moral knowledge, will have the authority and confidence of knowledge only after they've been found to be in accord with reality on the basis of appropriate evidence for the field of moral inquiry, on the basis of rigorous argumentation, examination, experimentation, experience, study of authorities, and competing views, just like any other field of knowledge. But to rule out such a search in advance, without logical justification or evidentiary findings for doing so, is intellectually large. And in the struggle of life I care most about, the struggle against violence and massive human rights atrocities, the abandonment of the search for moral knowledge is devastating. In my experience, the capacity to engage the fight against violence and the most aggressive injustice requires five human qualities that flow indispensably from moral knowledge. A confident knowledge of what is real about our world, about human beings, about power, about evil, about the present, about the future, about you, about me. <coughs> Here are the five human qualities I think are necessary to sustain an effective engagement with violent injustice in the world. First, might be the most obvious, and that is the need for moral clarity. One must actually know and determine and discern right from wrong. Why is this so important? Because violence is so confusing. Those who use violence immediately wrap it in lies and deception. It's also important because people are afraid and they'll want to make excuses of complexity and clarity. It's important for this capacity for moral clarity also because many situations are authentically complicated. So there's nothing new about this. The Nazis were totally confusing to Germans. Apartheid in South Africa was massively confusing. Slavery was confusing. To contemporaries, violence is always confusing. So there's nothing new about this. What seems to be new in this era is it seems to be the first era that's been proud of its moral confusion. 
fascinating thing about history is that it shows that some people just were right about slavery and some people were wrong. Mm -hmm. Some people were right about the Nazis and some people were wrong. Some people were right about apartheid and some people were wrong. College professors paralyze earnest sophomores with clever and insoluble ethical hypotheticals that prove there's no right or wrong. Horror stories of imperialism and Western exploitation that are true enough, but not necessarily relevant to anything particularly at hand. And the mocking dismissal of earnest efforts to do anything good in the world is naive and simplistic and self-serving. Again, such repartee sounds so masterful in the little kind of lecture hall, but less so in the brick factories of slavery in Pakistan, but while sitting with a gang of the victim in Guatemala, she was baking into the death of AIDS. There is knowledge about right and wrong, and it's part of the university's job to help its students and its citizens find it. There is also, it is true, something called moral arrogance. That is a true thing. There's also something called moral ignorance. That's a true thing. There's something called moral hypocrisy. These are all true things, and best moral knowledge helps us avoid these. But then there is moral clarity. It exists, and it can be found. How much of it? I think enough moral clarity to do the right thing you can do in your day. Indeed, the great global effort since Nuremberg to establish and protect the most basic human rights has been built for 50 years on a stunning work of moral knowledge, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The confident assertion that many of the rights of all human beings are universal and knowable. We write them down. In every era of history, people have found the right thing and done it. And what seems confusing in hindsight is why everyone else was confused. This is moral knowledge. In my experience, and of course the experience of millions, for thousands of years, the teachings of Jesus have provided a profound source of moral knowledge. It was the moral knowledge of the Gospels, for instance, that fortified the civil rights struggle in America. And I'll never forget witnessing the power of moral knowledge to help transform the nation in 1995 in South Africa. I was in the first gathering in 1985 of the church leaders in South Africa, especially the, for the first time the white Dutch Reformed church leaders, the leaders of the church, which was the sponsors, sort of religiously, of the apartheid uh, system. And I remember Richard Tutu sitting with a group of about 12 of these uh, church leaders in the midst of the martial law of the apartheid crisis. And amazingly, Richard Tutu moves forward to these uh, white pastors, and he says, Pastor, I I first of all just want to say that I thank God that he sent you white brothers to South Africa. Experiment in the Says I thank you because you brought missionary hospitals. I was born in a missionary hospital, he said. I thank you you brought missionary schools, and I went to a missionary school. But most of all, I thank you that you brought to us the word of God. Mm -hmm. and now, my brothers, I must open up the word of God and show you where your heart existence is. By the next summer, the Dutch Reformed Church, under the leadership of Johann Haynes, started a party in Chelsea. And that was, in many ways, the deep crumbling of the confidence of white South Africans <coughs> to continue to pursue the party, the party system. Of course, for that choice, Johann Haynes, the moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, was then later murdered in his living room. There is moral knowledge found in the teachings of Jesus. The second quality that is required, I think, for engaging in the struggle for justice is extravagant compassion. Moral knowledge is needed to provide a basis for extending compassion to suffering people who are far away, unfamiliar, and unlike us. Compassion, of course, comes from these two Latin words, compassio, to suffer with. And why should I suffer with those who are far away, unfamiliar, and unlike me? Why should I choose to engage in the suffering rather than to run from it? 
Rwanda was such a dramatic example of those who simply did not receive our urgent compassion because largely they were just too far away, unfamiliar, unlike us, and had no discernible national interests. The prevailing inertia of the dominant culture will be, invited, will be to invite us into a world of need and mind, of self-absorption of the shriveled heart, because of course we are pain averse, and it hurts us to feel and sense the pain of others. What authoritative moral knowledge will rescue us from that? The third quality is sacrificial courage. The struggle for justice requires a basis in moral knowledge for sacrificial courage. Why? Because violence is ugly. It's scary. And it will come after you if you seem to oppose it. It exacts a price. It's committed 24-7 to what it is doing. And people don't get braver as they get grow older. This is the great sadness I can understand. So for those of us as students who are waiting to just get braver when we grow up, it turns out that the adults just get a little more scared. Mm. It makes sense in a certain, certain way because we require more things to lose. But what moral knowledge will rescue us? Perhaps the most stunning and powerful thing I've ever seen 